you know how to turn it on? <coughs> Hello? Hi everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, uh, Fred and, um, and Glenn for uh, giving me this opportunity to attend the workshop. Um, and I would like to talk to you about uh, sub-seasonal uh, predictability of precipitation. So the outline that I'm going to follow is, uh, first I would like to give an overview of the sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, project. Maybe some of you are not familiar with it. Uh, then I'm going to discuss uh, the predictive skill of precipitation in the subseasonal range. And um, the community is defining subseasonal range as lead times between two, uh, from two weeks to eight weeks. Uh, and this problem I have been studying. Um, first, uh, w one of the questions that I want to, to investigate is how forecast skill varies with uh, precipitation intensity. Um, and these, uh, first I'm going to show you results uh, for the winter season in the United States. And, um, and I'm going to, uh, later I'm going to show you uh, some results for South America. And then uh, conclusions. So if we think about uh, when numerical weather prediction started uh, in the 50s, there has been tremendous progress in, uh, uh, in the forecast skill in the short to medium range. Uh, so from one day up to 10 days or one week. So this graph here, uh, actually this paper by Bauer et al. Uh, summarizes very well the progress that has been made in uh, numeric weather prediction in the medium range. This figure here shows, uh, uh, here's year, and here's uh, some measure of forecast skill. And we have several curves, one, uh, each of these curves are for um, some lead time, like the blue is for three days, uh, red for five, seven, and 10 days. The top of the curve is for the skill in the northern hemisphere, and the bottom for the southern hemisphere. So what we see is that over time, forecast skew has been increasing significantly. And also, uh, the difference between the northern and the, 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 northern and the southern hemisphere has been um, becoming smaller and smaller, that means we have better observations in the southern hemisphere, and also models have been uh, improving in the southern hemisphere. So this is on one end of the spectrum, like from uh, short to medium range. On, the, on longer time scales, like seasonal time scales, oh, one thing that I wanted to point out here is that uh, the predictability on short lead times up to medium range, they are heavily dependent on the initial conditions. Okay. Now, on uh, Longer time scales, like seasonal time scales, um, we have seen uh, seasonal forecasts become operational. Uh, this example here from the IRI, the Institute for um, International Research Institute, we see that now several centers around the world, they are producing seasonal forecasts. <clears throat> the predictability on these uh, long time scales comes primarily from boundary conditions. And ENSO is one of the main sources of potential uh, predictability on these time scales. So between short and medium range and seasonal time scales, uh, there is a big gap in what we know about uh, uh, predictability in the sub-seasonal time scale. Um, and, and that's what I wanted to point out here. So, uh, in the sub-seasonal time range between 10 days and uh, up to a few months, uh, what we call sub-seasonal predictability, we don't know if we can explore uh, predictability on these time scales. 
And these time scales, they are very important because um, if we can develop uh, accurate and reliable forecasts on these uh, subseasonal scales, there can be uh, huge benefits for society because um, uh, uh, management decisions and also emergency preparedness, can, they can really take advantage of uh, forecasts on these time scales. <clears throat> and so many applications can be made uh, having this uh, forecast in mind. So based on these um, uh, facts, uh, several organizations like the World Weather Research Program, the World uh, Climate Research Pro Program, and Thorpex, they uh, implemented this uh, project called the uh, uh, Subseasonal to Seasonal uh, Prediction Research Project, or S2S. And one of the goals is to improve forecast skill and understanding on subseasonal to seasonal uh, time scales, especially with emphasis on high impact weather, so extreme uh, weather events. And also to promote, uh, promote exploitation of applications uh, from the forecast on these time scales. So the focus of this uh, project, the S2S, is from uh, two weeks up to a seasonal, season. Uh, lead times. Now, this, uh, um, together with this uh, idea for this project, uh, the S2S uh, uh, research community has uh, realized that there are some uh, sources of potential predictability on these uh, time scales. One of them uh, is the Madden Julian oscillation, the MJO. Also, stratospheric initial conditions are very important to improve uh, um, uh, to exploit uh, subseasonal forecast. Land, ice, and snow initial conditions, it seems that uh, uh, they play um, an important role in the subseasonal uh, forecast, and also sea surface temperatures. Together with this uh, S2S project, there are several, uh, a few sub-projects. Uh, they, they all focus in some specific uh, goals. There is one sub-seasonal sub um, S2S uh, sub-project devoted to understand more teleconnections and how they impact uh, subseasonal predict, sub S2S uh, predictability. The MJO is also another uh, sub-project. There is one um, focusing on the monsoons, one for Africa, extremes, and verification and products. Uh, one of the sub-projects that I'm participating is uh, on the extremes. And this is led by Frederic Vitard from uh, ICMWF. And uh, in this S2S uh, sub-project, we are interested in assessing the predictability of uh, extreme events, such as uh, heat waves, uh, cold waves, floods, extreme uh, heavy precipitation, etc. cetera. Uh, also, uh, sub-seasonal predict predictions of uh, tropical storms, and we are doing this on uh, case studies and um, things like that. So now, if you're not familiar with uh, the S2S uh, project, I would like to discuss a few points here because I think they are important uh, in how we can uh, investigate uh, S2S uh, predictability. So if you go to the ECMWF uh, website in the S2S uh, project, you can find this table. And um, uh, let me explain a few things here. So there are currently 11 models participating in this S2S project. Um, one, one thing that is, um, is a little bit complicated in this project is that each center is developing uh, forecasts with a different, uh, in a different framework. Uh, so some, some centers, they, they forecast um, up to 60 days, other, pro other centers up to 30 days, and things like that. For example, the ECMWF, uh, the forecasts run out to 46 days uh, lead time. The resolution, they have different resolutions, but in the S2S uh, database, they all have been uh, standardized to um, a one degree latitude, long, uh, latitude longitude resolution. And uh, now in these columns, we are seeing uh, here is uh, for near real time, as the S2S uh, forecast, they become, uh, become available, they are in the database. And he, on these columns here, they are for reforecast. Okay. Now in near real time, uh, the near real-time data also varies quite significantly. Some, some centers, they produce forecasts every day. They initialize the model and run out to 
30 days or 60 days, 40 days. Other models, they have less frequent uh, initializations. Um, the ECMWF runs two forecasts. Uh, they initialize two twice a week, Mondays and Thursday, Thursdays, and they run out for uh, up to 46 days. Um, for the ECMWF in near real time, there are 51 members in the ensemble. Um, and it, you can see that other centers, they have very uh, small uh, ensemble size. Some they have four, only four members, uh, 25. So it's quite variable. Now, one thing that we need to do also is uh, calibration in the forecast and also have large samples. So each center developed uh, reforecast. And if, for the reforecast, it's the same thing. So they are quite variable uh, the way they do. Uh, for the E7WF, the re reforecast have uh, 11 members in the ensemble size. Other centers, uh, like the NSAP, they have only four members in the reforecast. So this poses uh, some issues of on how you can investigate some problems. So what, I, what I'm interested in is in uh, extreme or heavy precipitation. And precipitation is very different from the other uh, fields, like the circulation or even temperature. So precipitation is highly variable in space and time. So ideally, we want forecasts with a very large ensemble, so that ensemble members, so that we can span all the possible outcomes. The other thing is that we need, um, uh, for precipitation, uh, in order to validate the forecast and uh, understand more about uh, subseasonal predictability, we need very large sample size. So working with uh, the near real time is quite difficult because especially if, you, if, we, if we don't have initializations every day, if you have only twice a week, the sample size becomes very small. So here in this uh, talk, I'm going to show you results based on the reforecast. For this MWF, um, we have 20 years, uh, twice uh, initializations at, uh, each week. They run out for 46 days. And we have 11 members in the, in the reforecast. I, I have also looked at um, the NSAP model. Uh, it seems that the ECMWF, at least for uh, precipitation in, North America, in the United States, uh, ECMWF is better than the NSAP. By not, not much, but it's, it, it's, it's better. Um, now, working with the other models for, to understand subseasonal predictability of precipitation becomes uh, challenging because of the small sample sizes. So why understand more about the uh, predictability of extreme events? This is quite obvious. Uh, uh, in this graph here, it shows the number of weather fatalities in 2016. And um, we have, uh, if you look at the red bars, uh, so here in the bottom is the type of weather events. So if you, if you look, for example, at the floods, and uh, winter storms, um, there are very large, uh, many fatalities occur in the United States every, every year. So uh, this is just to motivate uh, that we can have tremendous benefits if we can explore uh, subseasonal predictability of uh, extreme precipitation. So the questions that I, I want to investigate are listed here. So first of all, I want to, I think it's important if we determine if there is predictive skill, um, or what, what is the current predictive skill of uh, precipitation in the subseasonal range? And because we are dealing with uh, extreme events and also uh, on uh, very long um, lead times, uh, the, pro the forecasts have to be probabilistic in nature. Um, then the second question is, how does the predictive skill of precipitation vary as a function of uh, precipitation intensity. Uh, one outcome of this could be to determine if heavy precipitation is more or less predictable than light to moderate precipitation. And uh, I'm going to show you results for uh, the United States. But also what is important is to understand how predictability of precip heavy precipitation varies on different uh, climatic regimes. Um, and I'll show some results later for this. So in the first part of uh, this talk, I'm going to show, as I said, um, exam this uh, S2S probabilistic forecast skill of precipitation in the contiguous United States um, during winter time. So 
we're going to look at uh, forecasts from November 1st up to March 31st. And uh, this plot here shows the climatology. So in doing, during the um, uh, winter season, precipitation is very heavy in the, um, in the western United States, especially along the coast or on the, or, or on the western states, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Then you have a minimum here in the central part. And then in the eastern part of the, the US, we also uh, precipitation is very uh, heavy. So first, I'm going to show you several steps in the methodologies so that we can um, understand more about the, the results. So I'm going to use only the ECMWF uh, model. The forecast range goes out to 46 days. Uh, the spatial resolution that we are using is a one degree latitude longitude. There are 11 members, one control and 10 perturbations, two initializations per week, always on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, the period is uh, November 1st to March 31st from 1995 to 2015. I'm using the reforecast. For ver verification, I'm using uh, the CPC, the Climate Prediction Center Unified Precipitation Gridded Data. Uh, and then there are a couple of intermediate steps. So first I, I interpolate the model forecast to the same grid of the verification. Um, then I estimate the daily mean model bias. Uh, the model bias is going to be a function of uh, space, latitude, longitude, and also the lead time. And I remove the, the model bias from the forecast for each day, each, each grid point, etc., and each lead time. Now, because we are um, uh, in this um, subseasonal project, we are interested in exploit, exploiting uh, predictability. And uh, in the after, or well, precipitation is always uh, very variable in space and time. So here, instead of looking at uh, daily precipitation, I'm averaging into uh, weekly mean precipitation. And that helps to reduce noise in the data. Uh, then for each grid point, I. Um, I'm going to I fit a, a gamma probability distribution function, um, and I do that for the validation data set and also for the forecast. Now, for the forecast, uh, since I, we don't have a, a free run from the ECMWF, we don't have a climatological run from the ECMWF, I use the one-week lead uh, to fit the, uh, the, the gamma PDF. So. Uh, if here is a schematic of the uh, a PDF for precipitation in this time period from November to March, uh, instead of just looking at one precipitation uh, intensity, I'm actually computing uh, the percentiles uh, in the PDF from uh, the 10th, 20, 30, etc., up to the 90th percentile. So I have di uh, nine different categories of precipitation. Uh, in this first uh, set of uh, uh, categories of precipitation, I look when the, um, I look for the probability forecast of precipitation being less than a given percentile. For example, less than the 40th percentile, ten, uh, 30, etc., up to the 10th percentile. That's what is in, uh, in orange. And then the other set of uh, uh, probability forecast, I, I look when the uh, probability forecast is greater than, for example, the median or the 50 percentile, greater than the 60, 70, etc., up to 90 percentile. So we go from um, moderate precipitation up to, uh, to the tails of the PDF, to very uh, heavy precipitation. <coughs> uh, now, the, for the forecast, the probability forecast is is computed as uh, the number of members forecasting that given event divided by the total number of events, uh, total number of members. Uh, so 11 members here. Uh, the validation, as I said, is uh, from November to March 1995 to 2015. Each season, uh, from November to March, there are 44 initializations. Uh, each each initialization. Uh, the forecast run out to one to six weeks lead time. So that's the, the, uh, the lead range that I'm going to show results. So in total, there are 800, for each grid point and each lead time, there are, 
there are 880 forecasts that I'm going to validate. And here you can have an idea if, um, if, we, uh, if we have a very short, a very small uh, sample size in the reforecast of, or um, if we have very small ensemble members. So that poses some complications. Because in the end, you, we end up with, with a very small sample size to verify the forecast. Now, how, uh, there are many ways to verify the forecast. Um, for validation, for probabilistic forecast, uh, I'm using this methodology here. So if we think about a given uh, precipitation category, which, is, which depends on the percentile that I showed earlier, and lead time, we're going to have uh, um, pairs of uh, forecast probabilities, here indicated by Y. Uh, so the probabilities, of course, are between uh, 0 and 1. And for validation, we have the outcome. So this OK, this OK is 0 if the event doesn't occur, and 1 if it occurs. Then to validate this uh, probabili probabilistic uh, forecast, uh, we use the Breyer score. The Breyer score is, um, is, the, is the mean squared difference between the forecast probability and the outcome. OK. So we want Breyer score to be as small as possible, like an RMS <coughs> error. Okay. Now the Breyer skew score is computed as a function of the Breyer score, BS here, uh, normalized by the reference. And the reference, we usually use uh, the climatological uh, probability. So uh, we compute this from the, um, from the observations with uh, the CPC unified uh, grid data set. Uh, so the climatological Forecast is you always use, for that given day, you always use uh, uh, the climatological probability. Okay. So the first question is, um, what is the current uh, probabilistic forecast skill in the sub-seasonal range, at least from the, the CMWF uh, model? So here is the Breyer skew score, and the formula is there. First, looking at the Breyer skew score, when precipitation, uh, for forecast of precipitation exceeding the 50th uh, percentile or above the median. So each panel here, it goes from uh, one week lead time, two weeks, three, and four weeks uh, lead time. And here's the Bryce Q score. So uh, as expected, for up to one week lead time, uh, the skew is quite reasonable. So uh, the colors here, they represent um, improvement from uh, the climatological forecast. So most of over the United States, we see improvements uh, ranging from uh, 30, uh, 30, 30 to 40 percent better than climatology. In some places, uh, it's, it's less. So it, it, uh, the improvement is only 10 to 20 or, or so percent. As the lead time increases to two weeks, three, four, the skill drops. Now, if we look at another uh, precipitation category, like when uh, forecast when the precipitation exceeds the 70th percentile, um, we see some interesting changes here. So first, for one week lead time, actually the, the skew is better in this MWF model. So you see in, in, in many places for in this category, um, the, you see lots of uh, yellows and uh, light greens. For 70th, percentile, you start to see improvements on the order of 50 to 60 percent uh, over climatology. And also, not only for one week, but also in two weeks, you see, uh, you, still, you, you still have a actually very uh, reasonable skill into these uh, week lead times. And if we increase uh, the percentile, or for this uh, precipitation category, probably forecast when the precipitation exceeds the 90th percentile. Uh, for one week, you can, you can also see that in many places here, the, the skill improves to 60, 70, uh, in some places even higher. Okay. And the same thing for uh, two, three, four weeks lead time. Another way of looking at these uh, results is uh, aggregating over uh, different sectors in the US. Uh, so I split the contiguous United States into three sectors, Western, Central, and Eastern. And I comp for each sector, I computed the percentage of that sector 
with Bryce Q score greater than a given threshold. And um, that's, that's the type of uh, curve that we get. So let me explain this. So this is when the precipitation is above the, the median value, the 50th percentile. Uh, here in the bottom is the lead time from one week up to six weeks. And the color represents the percentage of that sector that had uh, Bryce Q score greater than the threshold. The threshold is here in the, in the vertical. So for example, in the eastern US, for one week lead time and Bryce Q score greater than 10, 10%, almost uh, uh, from 80 to 100% of that sector had skew better than that threshold. So if you increase the threshold uh, from 10% to 20 or 30, the percentage of that sector that had that given uh, uh, threshold, uh, Bryce Q score drops. So you see that it goes to only 10 or 20 or 30% of that sector. And as the lead time increases, the percentage of that sector with that uh, Bryce Q score also drops. And the same for the other uh, sectors in the, in the Western and Central US. So it's interesting to see that in the eastern US, uh, the predictive skew of uh, precipitation is not that great after two or three weeks lead time for precipitation exceeding the median value. Now, if we increase the, um, the precipitation threshold, or in other words, when precipitation exceeds the 70th percentile, we get a very different <coughs> uh, curve. Now, for example, again, in the eastern US, uh, the percentage of that sector that, have, that has a uh, uh, Bryce Q score greater than a given threshold increases to longer lead times. For example, uh, up to three, three weeks, uh, let's say three weeks for uh, Bryce Q score between 10 and uh, 15 or 20%. 20 to 30% of that sector has that given Bryce Q score. So it, these curves, they, they increase upwards and also to the, to the right. Now, if we increase uh, <coughs> the precipitation threshold to 90th percentile, we, we can see that there is still some skill on lead times from three to six weeks, which is, which is uh, encouraging. So that's good news. But uh, the Bryce Q score is just one single measure that, um, that can uh, give you an idea about the, the, the skew in the forecast. There are other measures to, to measure the, the, um, the quality of the forecast. One of them is called the reliability uh, diagram. So in the reliability diagram, we have to compute uh, some other statistic parameters. One of them is called uh, the conditional average observations. So we are looking at uh, the probability of uh, the outcome or that event occurring for a given uh, probability forecast. Okay? So you have to compute this statistic, uh, statistical measure. And, uh, but basically, this tells you how well each forecast is calibrated. <clears throat> now, the other parameter is called uh, the refinement distribution. Um, and it gives, uh, computes the number of uh, you have to compute this n sub i is the number of times each forecast is used uh, in this uh, in this in this uh, data set. So the refinement distribution gives you it tells you if the model can discern different outcomes. And here's uh, some uh, schematic uh, possibilities of what can hap happen. So if the model is well calibrated, uh, ideally this. Uh, conditional average observation is going to follow along this one-to-one uh, uh, -one line. Now, if you have uh, over, over forecasting or a wet bias in the model, uh, they deviate from the one-to-one -one, uh, line. And you can have many different uh, pro uh, possibilities in the, in the conditional average from the model. In the refinement, refinement uh, distribution, if you have this type of uh, distribution, uh, it indicates that the model has a low confidence. And if you have uh, this other type, it, sh it says that it has intermediate confidence. And uh, this type, uh, uh, the model is, is highly confident in the probabilities. Uh, this is what we get for the reliability diagrams. Now, 
one complication is how to visualize this because for, I, for each grid point in the US, I compute the reliability diagram. So in order to get an idea how the, the model, uh, how, what is the reliability in the ECMWF forecast model, I average all the reliability diagrams over the US where the Bryce Q score was positive. Okay, so uh, just to get an idea how the reliability diagram looks like in point, grid points where there was some skew. Okay. And uh, so here we are looking at the reliability diagram for one week lead time, uh, two, three, and four weeks uh, lead time. So for one week lead time, we see that uh, the model, uh, it doesn't, uh, the conditional frequency doesn't fall along the one-to-one -one line. So the model, uh, actually the, the, the conditional uh, frequency, it, it is above the one-to-one -one line for probability forecast from 0 to 0.2, okay? Now for probability forecast greater than that, then it deviates from the one-to-one -one but below, below the one-to-one -one, uh, line. So it indicates that the model has some uh, conditional um, uh, bias on the, on the re in, the reliable, in the forecast. Now, as the lead time increases, you can see that this line gets even further and further from the one-to-one -one line. Uh, by three weeks, the model uh, shows, um, starts to show very poor resolution in the forecast. So that's for uh, precipitation exceeding uh, 50th percentile. <clears throat> now, for 70th percentile, it kind of looks like the same um, with uh, some small difference, but the main point is that as the lead time increases, even though the Bryce Q score is, uh, can be large, uh, like 20% or so average over the grid points where there is Q, uh, the model, uh, it doesn't have a resolution. So it needs some calibration has to be performed. So <clears throat> one of the conclusions from this is that is there is Q in probabilistic forecast of precipitation in the subseasonal range? So probably yes, but if we need to do additional uh, calibrations in the, in the forecast. <coughs> so the next question is, uh, how does the predictive skew of precipitation vary as a function of precipitation intensity? Uh, since I computed uh, this uh, probabilistic forecast for nine categories, we have uh, nine different percentiles, I can actually plot uh, the Breyer skew score, uh, sorry, I can plot this um, uh, forecast validation matrix for div as a function of the percentiles of the precipitation. So here, uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, how the Breyer score varies as a function of the precipitation intensity of, or the precipitation per percentile. So here in the bottom is the percentile of precipitation, and here's the Breyer score. And I separate the curves for one week lead time, and then in this other uh, plot, for the, uh, it shows the Bryce Q score for two to six weeks. Now, there are a few points here that I want to highlight. So first of all, you see that the, I, I mentioned that you want the Bryce, Bryce score as small as possible, because it's kind of a, it's like an IRMS metric. So if we, com we can see that the Bryce score for one week is less than the Bryce score for two to six weeks. So that this curve is below those curves. The other point is that um, if we, we, we see that it has a, this uh, negative slope, uh, so if we, if we think about, for example, uh, forecast above the 50th percentile, like here in the middle, as we increase the percentile, uh, the probabilities become smaller and smaller in the forecast and also in the outcome. So it's, it's, it's natural that it has to decrease because you're summing smaller and smaller numbers, right? So it, it has this negative, uh, it has this kind of slope. The same for one week and two weeks. The other thing that is interesting is that <clears throat> if you look at two to six weeks, it's almost linear. Uh, the Bryce score varies as a function of precipitation percentile almost linearly. Now for one week, it's also decreasing, but it has this uh, a slight change for some percentiles, for 20 percentile. 
Now, when we compute the Breyer skew score, which is, again, is given by this uh, formula. So you're going to uh, normalize by the, or divide by the, the Breyer uh, skew score, the Breyer score from the reference. The reference is the climatological probability. Okay. So it turns out that for one week, we have this kind of shape in the Breyer skew score which is quite different than the Bryce skew score for two to six weeks, lead times. So for Bryce skew score uh, up to, for one week lead time, is going to maximize uh, for per precipitation percentiles between se 70 and 80% here. And it goes to a minimum uh, for low percentiles. Now for two to six weeks, uh, it has this, uh, kind of a parabola shape. So the Bryce skew score is smaller for precipitation percentiles, um, forecast of precipitation above the 50th percentile. Now, as we increase the uh, threshold for uh, the precipitation percentile, the, the Bryce skew score is actually higher. Okay. Now, these results, they were uh, for the um, for the United States. Uh, now, uh, what I showed you is for the winter time, for the winter time and um, over the US, right? So how these uh, results may vary over a different uh, climatic regime. So one thing that I, I, I did is compute the same thing for um, South America. So now if it, we are looking at, well, I'm going to show you results also from November to March but it's the southern hemisphere in uh, summertime. So we go from uh, mid-latitudes, uh, exotropics, mid-latitudes in the US, different precipitation regimes, to South America, where it's very highly convective and uh, the summer monsoon. So here is the, uh, the Breyer skew score uh, for precipitation exceeding the 50th percentile, 70th percentile in this column, and 90th percentile. So for one week lead time, we see, um, in some places, we see high, high scores, uh, um, uh, a good skill in the forecast um, for 50th percentile and 70th percentile. In some places here, especially in the, in the eastern uh, part of South America, in Brazil, uh, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, the score, the Bryce skew score is between 30 and 40% better than climatology. As the, and as the lead time increases to two to three and four weeks, uh, it starts to uh, decrease. Now, let me see. <clears throat> I also computed the reliability diagrams over South America for each grid point. And one thing that is very challenging is that the reliability in the forecast is quite variable in space. So you may pick one grid point and look at the dia uh, reliability diagram and it's quite reasonable. Then you look at the grid point, just next, the next grid point, and you have a very poor calibration in the forecast. So it, it uh, indicates that it's quite challenging. We, we have a lot of work to uh, explore this uh, probabilistic forecast in the sub-seasonal range. Now just to show uh, this, uh, compare the same results, here is the Bryce score. Again, the same plot. Here's the precipitation percentile and the Bryce score for one week lead time, two to six weeks lead time. It behaves almost similarly. There are some differences. The, this uh, slight tilt in the, uh, for one week lead time is not as apparent as in the, as in the over the US. So you get uh, kind of a different shape. So some conclusions, uh, probabilistic forecast of precipitation over the US. So the ECMWF shows uh, high skew up to one week, which is kind of expected. Uh, the Bryce skew score can be up to 40% better than climatology for precipitation exceeding the 50th percentile. But if we increase the, uh, the percentiles, the Bryce skew score is much higher, actually. Uh, it shows uh, skew out to two to four weeks, uh, higher for heavier precipitation but also it shows conditional biases and uh, indicates that uh, we have to do better calibration in forecast. 
there is a distinct behavior in forecast skew versus precipitation intensity. And um, as I showed you, you have this different behavior in the, in the Bryce skew score and the Bryce score. Uh, now, just a few words about um, how I'm planning to use the OpenIFS. Uh, <clears throat> in another paper, we did some predictability studies using uh, WARF. And um, uh, one of the results from that study is that, uh, as I mentioned before, the MJO is considered a, 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 a very important potential source of predictability in the subseasonal range. Now, one thing that I did in this study is to look at one case study when the MJO was occurring. And um, I look at how forecast errors grow within the MJO. And um, one of the conclusions is that the forecast errors on scales not directly associated with the MJO, they grow very, very fast. And they can actually propagate to the exotropics and impact the forecast scale over the, in the exotropics, for example, in precipitation forecast in the US. Um, now, the WARF is a regional model, and um, uh, all the results that I showed here, uh, they, for the ECMWF, they may be model dependent, so we need to look at other models. So in this predictability studies, uh, predictability study of the MJO, um, I'm planning to use the OpenIFS to conduct a more, um, uh, a more, uh, a more investigation of how forecast errors when the MJO is occurring, how they grow in time. So that's what I'm planning to do with uh, uh, OpenIFS. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for, <coughs> for this nice overview.